Μπορώ να ξεκινήσουμε. Okay, hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, it's uh, this is uh, uh, a, a discussion, um, a panel that will be conducted in English, since it's part of an international research uh, program. Uh, it's the Demos project, uh, taking stock of populism in Europe uh, is the title of this uh, panel, and it is. Uh, it's an ELIA map project, but it's a part of a, a greater European project. We are going to discuss it. You are free to raise questions or remarks uh, during the conversation. You can do it either by signing and taking uh, the floor or by addressing questions, written questions uh, or uh, remarks uh, to, the, to the panel. Um, let me start by asking Professor Sotiropoulos to give us some background information about what this project is about, what uh, and what are we going to um, follow today? Thank you, Mr. Tsimas, for coordinating and chairing this meeting. My name is Dimitri Sotiropoulos. I'm a senior research fellow at the Hellenic Foundation for European Policy, uh, Euro Foreign European Foreign Policy, and also professor of political science at the University of Athens. The Eliambe Foundation is one of the 15 research foundations and universities which try to address the following question. What are the different varieties of populism in Europe? And in addition, what would be the best way to develop democratic efficacy? Democratic efficacy is a term which I will now explain and obviously refers to the acronym of the research project, namely DEMOS. So by democratic efficacy, we mean the possibility that citizens acquire political skills to stand up against threats to democracy. For example, if populism is understood as a potential threat to democracy, how it would, would it be possible to increase democratic efficacy so that populism is constrained? This project, which is a comparative research project rather than a theoretical project, takes place in many countries around Europe, and research stream teams have been able to converge on a broad definition of populism so as to include different uh, emphasis that each research team wants to employ in doing research. This very broad definition is the following. Populism is a political ideology and also uh, often a political party or a social movement, which distinguish the political world in two halves. One is the people, the other is composed of the elites. Obviously, the second half is very small, and these um, elites uh, govern or attempt to govern the people without their consent. Thus, we understand the world, if we are populists, in such a Manichian dichotomic fashion the people against the elites. Moreover, um, this approach that says um, that populism is moreover a political ideology rather than just a political party or a movement emphasizes that there is a normative superiority to the addressed um, to the people, assigned actually to the people. Namely, uh, regardless of what kind of constitutions or political institutions exist in democracies, it is always important for populists to claim that they represent the people authentically and better than any other political ideology or political force. To sum up, this very broad definition says that um, populism is a political ideology that pits the people against the elites, and also populism claims that the people are always superior, not only to the elites, but also to the political institutions of democracy. Uh, thus, we have started doing research on more empirical aspects of populism, on which my colleagues will now enlighten you. Thank you very much, Professor Sotiropoulos. So, uh, my name is Pablo Simas. I'm a journalist. Uh, I've been a journalist for almost four decades uh, in Athens, and uh, I'm very happy to participate in this discussion. And um, I would be participating, I guess, even if I wasn't uh, uh, invited to, to moderate it. Um, 
Professor Sotiropoulos, who we, we just heard, is a senior fellow of LMF and he's a professor of political science in Athens University. Um, in this discussion are taking part also Mr. Dimitris Katsikas and uh, Mr. Manus Tsatsanis, and we have with us uh, Professor Yanis Papayorgiou from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, who will comment on uh, uh, what we will hear together. So let me start by uh, with Mr. Dimitris Katsikas. Uh, Professor, please give us your... Uh, we will start with you and uh, please announce the, the the title of uh, what you we're going Let to be hear. Sure that my I understand, as Mr. Sotiropoulos said, this is a very broad issue. And the interesting thing is that in the overall research program, there are different, a, a very wide array of issues and uh, subjects that uh, are investigated. So uh, please take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Simas. Let me share first my screen to... You see my presentation. Uh, can you all see that? I think so, yes. Okay, so my name is Dimitris Katsikas uh, uh, and I participated as well with Professor Sotiropoulos and Dr. Tsatsanis uh, in the DEMOS project. I have to say that my uh, uh, participation in the project was a bit more limited than, than that of Dimitris and Manos. Uh, I, I mainly participated in two work packages, specifically uh, work packages 2.5 and 5.2, with both of which relate to the link between populism and public uh, policy. Uh, also, the focus of the work I was involved with, um, it's not comparative, like some of the F uh, data and findings you will see later on by my colleagues, but rather it focused in, on Greece, in the metapolitical sphere, and mostly um, on economic aspects of public policy, let's put it simply on economic policies in, in Greece during that time. A number of research questions uh, were, uh, were addressed. Uh, timing, because often uh, there's this conception that populist policy making uh, is a kind of reaction to uh, some sort of crisis or, a, or an austerity program of some kind. Um, uh, as well as two other broad categories, policy contents and policy discourse. Various aspects were examined and I will try to convey very briefly some of the findings there. Um, let me start with a very brief theoretical digression on economic populism. Economic populism is typically defined as a reaction to economic crisis in the, in the literature. This is because the classic literature in this area was developed in reaction to a crisis in Latin America in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, and uh, a, a very uh, famous uh, um, definition, if you like, of economic populism, as described by the authors referenced here, um, uh, very simply put is that um, a populist uh, party that comes to power denounces the previous stabilization policies, for example, an IMF stability program like the ones we had here in Greece, and then um, stops all related policies and then um, uh, begins with its own policy paradigm, which consists of, uh, as the authors say, in reactivation of the distribution. Simply put, this means that government tries to increase the disposable income of people through deficit uh, policies, increasing the public deficit, the fiscal deficit, and uh, supposedly this will lead to, uh, to increase in demand, consumption, and the economy will kickstart and growth will ensue. Unfortunately, things do not work this way exactly in the economy. So typically this kind of policy experiment ends in tragedy uh, in a worse economic crisis than before and a new stabilization program. And this has been the historical experience in most cases. Um, However, the crisis is not necessarily a precondition because we also see economic populism in other times. And this is related more broadly, if you like, to the issue of time inconsistency, which is inherent in politics. That is the, the tendency of politicians to break the promises in order to gain short-term profits, political profits, uh, and often by promoting populist policies. So um, this is a broader issue and not uh, theoretically, at least and not um, necessarily related to crisis. Uh, in order to see that, how this plays out in the, in the Greek framework, 
um, we, we examined briefly the timing aspects. First of all, here we have to say that populism is a diachronic feature of the Greek political system uh, from the beginning of modern Greece, really, but it has been dominant in, in center periods. Um, in, in the Metapolitefsi era, the literature generally, the international literature, acknowledges two major episodes of, of populist governance, if you like, where populist parties assumed power, Pashok in the 1980s, and the um, Syriza Nel coalition government in 2015. Um, and what we see from these experiences, but also from the broader Metapolitefsi experience, is that in the early 80s, um, the time, the, the, the new economic policy paradigm promoted by PASOK, which uh, was quite populist in its content, um, was not related to a crisis, it was not a reaction to a crisis, but rather to, in, in my view, to a, a major, a gradual major sociopolitical change occurring after the um, transition to democracy. Um, in the 19, uh, 1930s, uh, on the other hand, with, uh, when Syriza and Anel took power, uh, obviously then the, the catalyst was the crisis and the unprecedented socioeconomic effects they it had on the, on the Greek people. Um, so uh, from these two episodes, we see that change seems to be an important facilitating factor, but it's not necessarily related to a sudden economic shock or even limited to material conditions. Because again, in the 1980s, uh, it was more of a normative, I would argue, and a political change that was taking place rather than a material one. Um, on the other hand, uh, throughout this period, even when other uh, governments, or even PASOK itself later on, which not considered the populist party anymore, uh, took power, uh, populist elements in public policy uh, remained um, uh, evident throughout uh, the period. Um, in terms of policy contents, um, uh, we can see, uh, I mean, in the literature, again, there is this distinction usually uh, used between inclusive and exclusionary uh, populism. Left-wing populism is considered inclusive, uh, in contrast to right-wing populism. Uh, and, and the main difference here is that left-wing inclusionary populism tends to include people thought to be previously left behind, like the poor farmers, uh, minorities, and so on. Uh, whereas a, a right-wing tends to be more exclusionary in the sense that it focuses on excluding from economic rewards uh, various groups like foreigners, immigrants, uh, minorities, and so on. Um, so at, at the public discourse level, it's quite easy to distinguish the two uh, type of discourses between left-wing and right-wing parties, but often at the public policy uh, level, uh, this is more complicated. So for example, although uh, left-leaning or left-wing or central-left parties like PASOK or CISA later on um, instigated several um, inclusive view-like policies, this for the most part throughout the Metapolitics era were uh, maintained by New Democracy, which is a central right party, and they were not cancelled by it. So um, uh, both uh, all types of governments, uh, irrespective of ideology, tended to 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 employ such uh, such policies, and also um, all governments tended to employ some characteristic populist policies. For example, cash transfers in social policy. <clears throat> Traditionally, in Greece, governments instead of trying to build to to, to establish a universal welfare state. They have opted for the tool of cash transfer social policy, which is a, a tool very nicely fit for populist and clientelistic, another feature of Greek politics uh, purposes. Now, in terms of the consistency of the policy paradigm, this is again the picture is more uh, mixed if we compare the two eras. In the 80s, the policy, idea, the ideology of the party, the policy discourse, and the actual policy implemented, the economic policy actually were, were in sync, they were consistent. Whereas um, in, in 2015 and on, uh, particularly after the signature uh, of the third memorandum, the, the Syriza government obviously was a obviously break between uh, the, the ideology of the party, its discourse, and the policies implemented. And, and here, uh, it's very interesting to, um, to see the role of, condition of the, what is called generally the external constraint in the literature. And here we mean two things. First, conditionality. Uh, I mean, um, Syriza had to operate within a, a, a memorandum framework and uh, strict um, conditions from the from the creditors, and also the linkage, uh, as is called in the in the literature um, aspect, which here which denotes really um, 
relations and connections to the international environment. Here, really, we mean EU membership and EMU membership. Greece was part of the Eurozone, and that placed its own constraints. So conditionality and legacy seem to complicate things. So uh, the left wing uh, party with a very populist discourse before uh, assuming power was actually not able to implement the policies it, it wanted. Um, very briefly going through some of the other aspects in terms of policy content, there is a cost, a cost to be borne when uh, governments pursue populist policies. In the 1980s, one could say that the burden was mainly borne by future generations through the increase of public debts. Um, and again, also obviously on the private sector uh, through increased taxation, regulation, bureaucracy, uncertainty, and so on. Uh, but it is interesting to note that many of these policies remain intact even under new democracy government, which supposedly would be more friendly towards business. Um, uh, the the, the series anel government, on the other hand, we, we know and there has been the discussion reiterated in the past few days actually, uh, that the, a lot of uh, burden was put on, on the middle class in the private sector through mainly through taxation in the context of the, of the program, the third program. Um, an interesting point also here between the two related to what I said before is the policy break. Again, Pasok in the 80s was able to break with the past in the sense that in the 80s it was able to complete a shift that was already take, taking place in, from the late 70s. The economic post-war paradigm in Greece was industrialization and modernization of the economy coupled with monetary stability. This changed, started to change after, uh, after the mid-1970s and it was completed this uh, change and embedded uh, in Greece with uh, Pasok in power. Um, the new economic policy paradigm was based on redistribution, basically, and a strong presence of the state in the economy. Um, on the other hand, Syriza um, was not able to, to, to implement a major break with the previous policies, uh, since it had to sign and implement effectively uh, a memorandum and implement policies that had been denouncing up to that point. Now, the governance is, can be related to some aspects of the policy discourse and the communication style in particular. So both the governance and the communication style of the policy in the 80s where it was more emotional, embedded broader and socialist narrative, non-technocratic, except perhaps in crises like the 1985-7 interlude. Um, and uh, something similar happened obviously during the crisis, even more so because of the crisis, some aspects um, and this continued, the discourse continued this way by Syriza, even after assuming power, even after um, signing the third memorandum. Uh, but obviously, there was a break with reality there. Uh, as so um, the rhetoric that was developed was that we, we have to implement this program, but we do it in a way which tries to, to stay faithful to our, 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 our objectives and our uh, promises. So, for example, we, oh, yes, we, we impose high taxation, but we did it in a way that betters the rich and provides relief to the poor. <laughs> um, whether it was convincing or not, this is not another issue. Uh, and of course, polarization is common in both periods. Polarization, again, is a structural feature of the Greek political scene. And um, polarization is actually very linked very much to the core of, of populism, as the Professor Sotiropoulos described it, this Mahinian kind of uh, conception of politics where two parts uh, conflict with each other, the people and the elites. So concluding very briefly and a um, uh, number of research questions for the future, populism is a complex and multifaceted phenomenon. We see it in Greece in the same country at different periods, even with similar parties in the sense that it come from the same side of the political spectrum, we see significant differences. Crisis and change more generally seem to be sufficient, but not necessary conditions to provoke uh, populist policy, public policy. In Greece, populism has been a constant feature of public policy, irrespective of different governments' theological profile, but it has become dominant, primarily when coming from the left. Um, populism fits polarization, uh, which is another sexual feature of Greek politics. Um, because I'm running out of time, so in terms of research questions for the future, I would like to focus on the first and the last, which are related which is, as I said, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, during the crisis and the series and L government, <clears throat> obviously there was the external constraints seem to be very effective in limiting the ability to pursue populist policy making. 
this on the one hand can be considered a good thing because this constraints uh, averted uh, perhaps catastrophic policy choices like the ones we saw in Latin America. On the other hand, there's an obvious uh, um, conundrum here and a conflict with liberal democracy principles in that a, a government that uh, has been democratically elected has to be able to implement its policy agenda for which it was voted. So how do you reconcile these things? This is also uh, an issue raised by Roderick recently, uh, it, where he said that, you know, in economic populism, there may be some legitimate demands in the sense that there are some real problems, for example, too much austerity, uh, which needs to be accommodated. And the challenge is how to do it without resorting to populist policy making. Can we do it in a way which is, you know, does not derail completely the economy and is not, does not obey a populist logic while trying to address the real problem underlying like populist, populist rhetoric? Um, I will leave it here. I'm happy to discuss some of these future research questions later on in the in the internet. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Professor Katsikas. That was very interesting. And it was, uh, oh, it's always interesting to make the, 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 the comparison of the two. Uh, distinct Greek uh, political experiences in the 80s and uh, mm -hmm. after 2015. Um, I, I, I'm always interested by the question, which is a, needs a completely different set of discussion. Where how does uh, a party that governs in, in a populist framework manages to land outside its uh, populist uh, rhetoric. How can a party reinvent mm. itself as Pasok did in uh, for a while in the mid 80s and then clearly in the early 90s? Mm. How, how, how do you do that? And uh, if it, it was done once, uh, is it feasible to do it again, to, to see it happening again, to see a, a party, a populist party coming to power using populist rhetoric, trying to govern according to its rhetoric and then uh, either through uh, outside uh, factors or by reinventing itself by by changing its course uh, becoming something completely different and keep it pre being present in the in the public sphere with a completely different uh, rhetoric and policy framework uh, i think <laughs> this is always a question that is interesting in the in the Greek national debate, but I also think in the European uh, debate also. Well, okay, um, I, I keep my remarks myself, and I uh, pass the uh, to 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 Manos Tsatsanis, who is a research fellow taking part in this uh, uh, research program. And I, I understand, Mr. Tsatsanis, that you are going to focus on communication issues, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, I'll try to share my screen as well. Okay. Well, so, so yes, okay. Uh, you're right, uh, Mr. Tsimas, uh, we change focus here. So we move to political communication and uh, more specifically political communication in social media. Uh, it's not zooming up. Okay. So as uh, Professor Sotiropoulos already mentioned, uh, this is quite a comprehensive project. So we, we try to examine uh, populism from uh, empirically, uh, but all kinds of different facets of populism. So the project uh, includes uh, examination of uh, policies uh, like Dimitris Katsikas presented before, political parties, party systems, uh, 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 the impact of populism on uh, civil society, and also political communication in a more traditional sense, but also one of the innovations of the project is that uh, we look at uh, populist poli political communication in social media, kind of employing this whole uh, uh, fashionable, let's say, big data uh, perspective. Uh, so um, this is uh, from uh, one of the earlier work packages. Uh, I mean, uh, Demos has, uh, if I recall correctly, about 11 different work packages. We have, there are 15 different national teams uh, collaborating. And this is part of the second work package. Uh, and unlike uh, the work package that focused on policies, which uh, 
primarily use the case studies to analyze the uh, uh, populist uh, uh, social policy or, or policies in general. Uh, this uh, this um, uh, package adopted a more uh, methodologically more comparative perspective. So we don't have case studies. We have uh, a kind of um, collaboration between the different national teams to, to uh, give a, a, a big picture of uh, political communication uh, in social media across Europe. So uh, the name of the, of the work package it's, uh, is called predictably manifestations of populism uh, uh, and uh, focusing on discourses. Uh, so, uh, like I said, the research examines populist communication uh, in 14 different countries uh, using the Facebook platform uh, and for a period uh, that uh, uh, focuses before and after the, the European elections of 2019. So the, the broad aim was to analyze both quantitatively and qualitatively uh, social media communication of select, uh, selected populist actors. So uh, the main, I mean, the research design was uh, uh, was uh, uh, selected to address uh, some specific research questions. Uh, the first question that we ask, pretty much in every work package, uh, in, in every uh, particular facet of populism that we examine, is: Can we empirically detect different varieties uh, of populist communication? Uh, I mean, this is part of the broader theme of, can we detect different varieties of populism in Europe? Uh, uh, a secondary research question um, uh, relates to uh, whether different varieties of uh, populism or populism in general uh, uh, leads to the adoption of different uh, or the promotion of different leadership styles and the models of representation more particular. Here we, we try to, to differentiate between uh, the trustee, the, the, the famous distinction between the trustee, the delegate, and the descriptive uh, models of representation. And our expectation, of course, would be that populist uh, communication would, would mostly promote the delegate uh, mode of representation, citing uh, uh, the fact that traditional politicians don't respond to the wishes of the electorate, and also this descriptive uh, uh, modes of representation, populists arguing in one way or another that we, the leaders, are one of the people like you. Uh, so this is what it means. So other, other secondary research questions uh, relate to um, um, the degree of populist communication in different periods. And here we look at uh, specifically whether in electoral periods, in uh, periods of higher political intensity, we, we can detect uh, in the political communication of uh, political and populist actors, more, uh, more populist messages. And uh, another one is whether uh, populist communication is mostly directed at the domestic level or at the European level. We have to remember this, this uh, research was conducted uh, around the time of the European elections in 2019. Now, uh, a, a side note about uh, anyone who's familiar with uh, the literature in on populism knows uh, that there have been definitional battles for decades and you know, scholars trying to define what populism is. And um, um, I mean, um, lately one could say that there are two, uh, uh, two prominent groups uh, within, uh, uh, within the definitional uh, discussion. And one is the so-called ideational uh, uh, perspective, which Professor Sotiropoulos already mentioned, which pretty much states that populism is a set of ideas, it's an ideology that's adopted and uh, uh, based on which we can differentiate uh, between populist, uh, between political actors. And the second one is that uh, populism is really a communicative style. Um, uh, the difference is in the unit of analysis, really. In the first case, we look at political actors. In the second case, we look, uh, we zero in uh, on, um, uh, on the message. And uh, this implies that uh, uh, populism can exist uh, to different degrees and uh, all political actors can be populism uh, at one degree or another. 
So uh, in this work package, we, we also employ this, this second perspective, the second definition of populism as a communicative style uh, and not just an ideology. Um, so uh, just briefly about the data and methods, I won't go into too much detail. I should say here that uh, a very detailed report of our, of our findings for this work package uh, uh, have been uploaded to the demos website. So uh, anyone interested in finding out more details about the research design, uh, uh, the findings and so on can download the, uh, the report from the uh, demos website. Perhaps later on we can give the URL address to anyone who's interested. So uh, um, what we did to examine Facebook posts is that we uh, collected uh, uh, via uh, web application, uh, web crawling application posts from uh, populist leaders in 14 different countries. Uh, here, there, it's, uh, I have included here a list of the countries that we looked at. Um, uh, for each uh, country, uh, each team had to select two different leaders. So we gave priority to the Facebook pages of, uh, of populist leaders. And in cases where uh, a, a populist leader did not have a personal web page, we looked at uh, the official party page uh, on Facebook. Uh, as I said before, we, um, uh, uh, we collected data from two different 14-day uh, uh, periods. One was right before the European elections uh, in May 2019. Uh, and uh, a second one after the elections in what we, uh, each national team deemed to be a non-electoral uh, or a post-electoral period. Uh, and all the teams were, uh, then we used a, a very uh, detailed uh, coding procedure in order to produce both quantitative and qualitative measures uh, of the populist, uh, of populist mess messaging. So uh, here I'm just going to refer because there are many subcategories and variables. I'm just going to uh, highlight three, the three main categories that we looked at when coding for uh, populist uh, messages. Uh, the first one, this follows uh, actually quite well the, the traditional minimal definition that Professor Sotiropoulos and Dimitris Katsikas have already talked about. Uh, so more or less uh, appeals to the people and the understanding that uh, uh, society is divided between two camps, uh, between a, a homogeneous notion of the people and the corrupt or let's say the, uh, the elites that are always perceived in a negative light. Uh, additionally, apart from these two uh, facets, we, we also included um, uh, a, a more thick version of populism, as we call it, one that includes um, references to negative re the references to other groups that are excluded from the construction of the people. Uh, these, uh, these indicators later on were further analyzed to identify uh, additional communication strategies. For example, reference to the people can take uh, the form of referring to the uh, major identity group or to demands for a more popular sovereignty. Uh, the main findings, uh, uh, well, some of the main findings here, I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Uh, first of all, uh, on average, about one in two posts uh, had some kind of populist references, one of the three criteria outlined before, but this is on average. Obviously, there, there was a lot of variation between countries. Uh, the highest percentage of populist discourse uh, uh, was found in uh, Hungary, Turkey, and Italy, followed by the UK, Poland, and France. Uh, predictably enough, populist discourse increased during electoral periods uh, in the form mostly of empty populism, that is just references uh, to the people, painting the people in a positive light, uh, and so on. Uh, empty, the combination of empty and anti-elitist populism was found to be more common in several countries with significant left-wing populist parties, such as Spain, Greece, and France, whereas uh, um, uh, exclusionary populism and emphasis on group identity was more common, uh, common in post-communist countries like Poland and Hungary, or countries uh, with strong right-wing populist parties uh, like the UK, Italy, or Denmark. So here I have, uh, I think I, uh, I don't have much time. I included some examples from uh, posts. I'm, I'm not gonna read them now. 
perhaps I'll stick to an example of anti elitist, uh, elitist discourse a post from Alexis Tsipras, which is, I, I, I selected this one because I think it's quite typical. Uh, it, and it says, uh, the Greece that found its stride and stood high again after hard periods was not the product of the aristocracy of the elites. Greece was, re, uh, was reborn by the children of farmers in Larissa that became doctors, by the, the, uh, the children of stock breeders in Epirus that, be, that became engineers, of shipyard workers in Piraeus that became scientists, by the children of day laborers uh, in Peristeri that became lawyers. So here we have a kind of uh, a familiar distinction between uh, the elite uh, portrayed in a negative light and uh, the people that they uh, mostly, uh, I guess, um, portrayed in terms of their humble uh, beginnings uh, of the, um, uh, and praising the people, of, uh, the simple people of, uh, in terms of being the, the backbone of, uh, of Greece and, and the Greek state. So, uh, okay, I'll just uh, move right to uh, the conclusion. Some, I mean, to list some of the key findings uh, of this research. First, uh, we, as we expected, perhaps there is no uh, single online populist strategy uh, across Europe. Uh, the frequency, the tone, and the topic uh, of social media usage by populist actors differs from country to country, uh, actor to actor. Uh, even though, uh, as I mentioned before, some rough ge uh, geographic patterns do emerge, uh, like Southern Europe versus uh, Eastern Europe uh, and Northern Europe. Uh, national elites, uh, national contexts, of course, are always very important in determining the different communicative strategies that are adopted. National elites are more frequently mentioned than supranational elites, uh, despite the first sample being uh, drawn from uh, a time around the European elections. Uh, one other very interesting finding is one of the common threads uh, uh, across populist discourses uh, was a strong current of uh, uh, Euroscepticism and anti-European sentiment. Uh, this uh, uh, more or less corresponded to all uh, different sub-varieties of populism. Uh, in uh, right-wing populist discourses, the people are generally constructed as victims of uh, cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan or Europeanized domestic elites. Uh, and of foreigners such as immigrants, immigrants, asylum seekers, and the bureaucrats of Brussels are, are typically singled out, whereas left wing populists tend to portray the people as the victims of uh, corrupt, uh, mostly economic elites or political elites and financial interests. So there is an emphasis, whereas uh, in right wing uh, discourse, there is an emphasis on identity, in left wing populist discourse, there is an emphasis on economics and uh, inequality. Uh, so I, I'm just going to stop here mentioning that uh, further research in the sixth work, work package uh, uh, complements this research by looking not just on the content of, uh, uh, of the populist communication, but also see how different populist actors uh, form networks uh, in uh, uh, online space. And I mean, who they relate to, uh, what type of other actors reproduce their message, and so on and so forth. We're still in, a, this is still a work in progress. So by the end of the project, we're hoping to uh, develop a more co comprehensive and, and fuller picture that brings the, the disparate elements together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sainz. I'm looking forward to that because you, you were trying to make sense and um, find a pattern uh, that. Uh, make sense out of this huge current of populist use of uh, online communication. So I, I, I would be very much interested to see uh, the end of this uh, research program and the, 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 the final outcome. So uh, up to now we had, we started by discussing populism uh, as a governing power what happens when a populist project becomes a government and tries to uh, enforce public policies. Secondly, we took a look into uh, the main uh, tool, uh, the main uh, 
uh, a, a road through which uh, populism is spreading around Europe, which is online communication. Now, I, I turn back to Professor Sotiropoulos. I understand that he is going to talk about the what the, 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 the what happens when specific social groups are targeted by populist rhetoric or by populist action. This is the result of a focus group, uh, focus group approach. So, uh, Professor Sotiropoulos, I'm turning back to you. Please, uh, yeah, turn on your mic. Okay, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tsimas, for this introduction. Uh, this is a research which tries to address uh, exactly as Mr. Tsimas says, what is the experience of uh, specific social groups such as minorities who have been <coughs> populist actors. And in fact, um, this was very important for me uh, as a political scientist because it stood as a corrective. I was biased. I thought populist actors were primarily political parties. That was not true. So um, the experience I had was that I organized with Manos Tsatsanis um, the research, which I'm going now to, to show, after uh, making, it, making it easier for you to move to uh, full screen, which I think I have done. And um, this was then the um, way we went by looking under um, the political parties and uh, above and away the political parties, which other political actors are populist in their understanding of politics and in their behavior towards vulnerable groups. We have the brief analytical framework about which uh, I talked at the beginning of today's event. We were guided by Turkish colleague, Sahin Osman, who was in charge of the comparative study of reactions of vulnerable groups towards political actors, such as populist media, um, also organizations of the far right who have been uh, indeed populist, not only in the way they talk, but in the way they behaved towards vulnerable groups. We collected data uh, based on the fact that we were able to meet in the form of a focus group with um, people who have very different sexual preferences and sexual identities. That was our first focus group. And the second one was a group that consisted of representatives of refugee and mi migrant communities here in Athens. So typical populist actors may have been um, in the past populist governments and populist political parties. But what about atypical political populist actors, such as movements which have been populist um, and mass media which are populist, or even other organizations, as I will explain in a minute, which have been populist. We try to see the patterns of behavior of such atypical populist actors. And I will offer a few examples of this interaction between atypical populist actors on the one hand and vulnerable um, groups on the other before I end with some policy recommendations. So I'll, as already mentioned, populism can be many things to different people. However, in this research, uh, which takes place across Europe, we define populist, populism um, as a set of um, ideas, but also communicative strategies, as my colleague Manos Tsatsanis has just explained. And uh, in this presentation, uh, I move one step forward. I'm saying to you, think of populism as a summary term for different mixes of nationalism, racism, sexism, plain intolerance of the other, the stranger, the unfamiliar group. How do such unfamiliar or vulnerable groups like migrants, the LGBTQI and the ethnic and other minorities react to populist challenges. They perceive such challenges are, as threats. And that is important actually for the populists themselves because 
to construct a populist challenge, populist actors put up sometimes fictional enemies. This is how they try to marshal su support, to marshal uh, support for their um, cause, which is to win political power. So they want to legitimize mobilize, the mobilization of the masses against the elites on the one hand and against vulnerable groups on the other hand. Obviously, in political terms, we talk about an asymmetry, an asymmetry of power between populists who often use actually physical violence um, on the one hand and vulnerable groups on the other. So um, this year and last year, four, um, four countries, five countries actually participated in this research under the DEMOS project. In each country, you had two focus groups and each group consisted of six to nine participants. All of us researchers in these five countries had the same thematic agenda. Some of the focus groups should have taken place in the same time. That was impossible because of difficulties provoked by the spread of the pandemic COVID-19. So in Greece, in the, uh, in the summer, we uh, talked with people who are members of the LGBTQI community of Athens here in the LMA premises. And then uh, over Zoom, we talked to representatives of migrant communities. It was not easy to um, actually organize this research. Naturally, such people are sensitive and sometimes are apprehensive of researchers as they are of publicity about themselves. However, we were successful in inviting such groups to talk to us. And we received guidance, as I said, by a Turkish colleague who is in charge of this particular task of the wider DEMOS project. So initially, one would have thought that um, our discussions would have centered on how populist governments have functioned, um, the Orban government in Hungary and the Erdogan government in Turkey. And that was correct, actually, in research conducted in this very same way in other countries. Uh, that is, through focus group research in other countries like Hungary and Turkey, we did have the opportunity, our colleagues had the opportunity to see how vulnerable groups reacted to populist governments. In Greece, we had focus groups which talked to us about the threats they felt that were coming from the side of the Golden Dawn, which were physical threats sometimes, but also the political rhetoric of other populist parties like the uh, ANEL. In uh, the UK, the context was very different populist rhetoric was marshaled uh, in order to win support by parties like the UKIP and the Brexit party. Along the way of conducting these focus groups, we found out that our interlocutors pointed the finger towards also state administrative authorities in this country, in Greece. For example, public employees in certain public agencies who uh, imitated or replicated the populist rhetoric, but also the church the press, social media activists, and informal populist groups. The idea was that um, such um, authorities, but also populist groups threatened the vulnerable groups through exercising physical violence, spreading hate speech, exercising indirect pressure on them in their working environment, preaching in public, but also campaigning through social media. What members of the focus groups told us, and that indeed scared them a lot, was that at a certain point in the last decade in Greece, such aggressive populist behavior was considered normal. Hate speech was not only confined in the chat rooms or in um, certain populist groups that were hostile towards uh, people who had different sexual identities or um, it was very normal to think and even express yourselves uh, in hostile terms against migrants. So what they said, what focus groups participants said to us was that there was very wide diffusion of nationalist, racist, racist sexist, and other discriminatory discourse. We do have evidence from other research which has been conducted in Greece on this, 
but it was really impressive to listen to such people who themselves had been targeted, less so physically, but often verbally, by populist actors. And indeed, uh, we have found out that it is not only the populist actors who disseminate um, populist rhetoric and make it sound like normal, but it is important to think that such populist rhetoric is tolerated. It is tolerated by authorities. It is tolerated by groups or media which themselves are not popular. So what we talk about is toleration, if not cover up, of populist actors in the middle and the lower ranks of state administrative hierarchies. There were examples of this. For example, um, employees of police, employees uh, or teachers in schools, lower ranking priests. Here is um, a set of very few examples which I have sampled for, for you. A sub-Saharan student, um, actually a student of Greek university who came from a sub-Saharan country, wanted to enroll because he was admitted to a Greek university and he had difficulties. Uh, so in his encounter with public employees in the secretariat of, of, of the university, given that he could understand Greek, Greek he caught the following phrase. One employee said to the other, he doesn't understand, he's not one of ours, he's not Greek. A migrant passenger told us that that was very common in a bus to be offended by other passengers who told her to shut down her phone, her cell phone, while riding, riding the bus. She was amazed because other people in the same bus, Greeks, were indeed talking on their phones as well, and as a matter of fact, as you may have experienced, uh, this is very frequent in buses around Athens, the bus driver himself was talking on the phone while driving the bus. Um, a homosexual pupil at school, also participant in our focus group, um, was subjected to bullying by classmates. He was left unprotected by school authorities. Finally, we know uh, the infamous case of physical violence against LGBTI to people, for example, uh, manifested in the violent death of Zach Kostopoulos in downtown Athens, and also in cases of um, excessive uh, oppression, namely police brutality ag uh, shown against migrants. And that was also something that um, members of the focus group shared with us. So um, what are the reactions of these vulnerable, vulnerable groups when they meet with such challenges? Here I have uh, four categories of reactions. This is the result of uh, work done in a comparative fashion, exactly because the Greek team as participates in this uh, larger group led by uh, Professor Sahin Osman, who uh, wrote down, based on comparative work, what are the typical reactions of the groups we studied. Echo chambers, such communities who are vulnerable tend to fall back on their own people their ethnic group, their migrant community. They talk only amongst themselves about the challenges they face. Secondly, they try to silence themselves or they change their words. In their, in their encounters with populist actors, they try to adapt to the way these other populist actors would like them to talk. So they actually also hide their thoughts and feelings. A third case not found in the, in the um, study in Greece is that people uh, move out. They leave the country in which they feel threatened by populist actors. And that is known, for example, um, in, in Hungary when, uh, where academics actually have left uh, Hungarian universities from what we gather by research from other people. And then um, the fourth case is active resistance to organize a parade to lobby the government to organize street protests. So um, what we see is that there is a possibility of self-organization of vulnerable groups, and that is a policy recommendation. We need, however, also to think of other policy measures. They need to establish independent monitoring by civil society organizations over state and non-state actors in case such actors resort to hate speech and practices. We need the state to step in and give assistance to vulnerable groups through training them on how to become recognizable rather than 
invisible or silent, and how to lobby authorities. Of course, we realize, and I end with this, that always we have to keep a delicate balance between sanctioning law-violating populists and safeguarding freedom of expression, but we need to think of the freedom of expression of the victims of populists as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sotiropoulos. That was really interesting, uh, especially yeah, the, the, because this is a, a, an issue that has been widely researched, but this the way of doing it through focus groups is not very common, and uh, I think it's very interesting. Okay, so let me uh, ask, me, ask Professor Papagiorgiou to give us his comments on what we have been following up to now. Yeah, uh, right. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mr. Chimas, and thanks to Elia Mep, the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, for asking me to discuss what I've heard, which is a lot and which is, I think, extremely interesting. I have to say from the start that I'm not an expert on the populist ideology. I mean, I'm most uh, dealing with uh, international and European politics. And I followed the three interventions uh, with interest, but also with some uh, view of, of a more global, let's say, approach. And I, I have a feeling which I want to share with the speakers and with the audience that it, it, it seems to me that we, that, I mean, uh, Professor Sotiropoulos said in the very beginning that uh, populism uh, has a lot of uh, connotations and a lot of um, uh, possibilities of analysis. And I have a feeling that we start looking um, to populism as a catch-all situation whereby uh, we cover issues that in the past could have taken a different name. For instance, uh, um, Professor Katsikas spoke about the populist um, populism in post metapolitics Greece. Uh, in the past, we had another word for that, which was, which was demagogy. So I, I have a feeling that Perhaps now we give to demagogic uh, positions of several parties, especially when they are in opposition, the term populism, and then we recognize or we realize, or these parties even realize when they come to, to government, that practically it is difficult to, to, to apply, to implement their demagogic promises and change direction. So, I, I was wondering, uh, I, I think uh, Professor Katsik has left, but I was wondering, Greece has a long tradition of demagogic political system. Often these demagogues, politicians in particular, or who, who, who tried to have a, a more direct relationship to the people and who blamed the elite uh, for um, a lot of the problems faced uh, by the country, uh, would they would they be qualified as populist in this from from an ideological point of view? Would is populism in Greece something that is embedded in parties, or is it just sort of a necessary tool for parties to become more? Um, how to put it, to become more popular rather than populist. So th th this is a question I have, and I don't know if, I don't believe that there is an answer. And I think this comes also to some extent uh, to what uh, uh, Professor Sotiropoulos said in his own intervention. Uh, I, I liked his approach that um, um, there are not only populist parties, but populist groups. But in, in some cases, what we what he described as populist for me would be criminal activities. I mean, um, is it is it correct to say that uh, a verbal aggression against uh, an immigrant by an individual by a bus driver is a populist, or is it just a discrimination or I don't know disparagement? I, I, I my question is why should we qualify as populist 
behavior, individual or group behaviors, which technically belong to the criminal code. Populism can be, how to put it, I, I, I'm not uh, very much uh, in favor of populism, but populism can be a, a, an acceptable means of political uh, promotion for political parties. If we try to integrate into populist uh, policies the aggression on an on homosexual by some persons, I, I feel that we, we go beyond the, the, the limits that uh, we could, what is the, the ideal, um, let's say not ideal, the, the ideological uh, uh, reading of populism. So I'm, I'm a bit worried that we try to, to introduce into the, a term which has the pros and cons, but is, is basically used to qualify political parties behaviors, group behaviors, which can draw on populist parties. Obviously, um, to go back to the Italian case, Salvini allowed, I mean, the, the discourse of Salvini was, um, of the Lega, was a way to normalize aggressions against immigrants. So there is definitely a linkage between parties and uh, discriminatory or uh, aggressive behavior, but some, I mean, I, I don't know in Greece, I, I'm, I'm not sure, of course, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't know the, the aggression uh, and, the, and the murder of Zach Kostopoulos, I, I'm not sure that this can be qualified as uh, uh, a populist attack. It was just a, a discriminatory attack which uh, of some persons or groups of persons or of persons who had specific stereotypes, let's say, but I, I, I would feel a bit unwilling to integrate it into a populist uh, behavior. Also, I'm not sure uh, that's, uh, I, I'm um, too much criticizing, not criticizing, I'm, st I'm, I'm staying a lot on, on Dimitris's um, on uh, Professor Sotiropoulos' uh, intervention. I don't know if Golden Dawn can be qualified as populist. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about that. What also is um, interesting, and I go to, to, to the middle speaker, to Dr. Tsatsanis, what I find also interesting in your research uh, is whether the patterns that you describe on Facebook are can be extrapolated also on Twitter. I know that um, Twitter, I, I don't follow very much Twitter because I'm not very good at that, but I know that Twitter has a different, because of the limit of words, has a different um, viewpoint. I mean, uh, the, the sentences that uh, Donald Trump, for instance, uh, um, bomb with which Donald Trump bombed the, the world uh, in the middle of the night were extremely interesting examples of populist discourse, but there were titles. Facebook can be more analytical. I don't know if you can say it analytical. And I, I, I followed a little bit the Twitter... Um, I don't know if he had, he probably had a Facebook. I was working on Brexit, so I followed a little bit Nigel Farage's uh, approach to that. And it is a very interesting use of words. I mean, Farage, is a, Farage was a journalist, I think, in uh, his previous career. And he had a very good grasp of sentences of the, of the language and also of the, um, of the double meaning of words. And I think that would be, it would be an interesting uh, analysis to see if there is a, a difference in Twitter or even in these even newer uh, forms of, uh, um, of uh, social media. This is mostly my, my remarks, questions and remarks, I think. And uh, I would like to have the point of view of uh, colleagues. Thanks again for inviting me. Well, thank you. Well, well th th there are three sets of uh, questions and remarks. A, there's a question of definition. 
uh, there's always uh, a demagogue in every populist, but uh, can you define every demagogue as a populist? This is, this is a question of definition. Then there's a, this second question, which I share. Um, how do you define, how, how, how do you look, uh, make the distinction between uh, a populist by ideology, which, which believes in uh, the populist terms and uh, notions that he uses, and a politician who is cynical enough to use populist tools as a way of uh, rising to power or keeping power? And then there's a third question, when populist stereotypes um, in a way leak out of the political scene and become embedded in social uh, uh, behavior, um, can you still define it as populist or is it something else? I think Mr. Papayor, you raised these three questions which are interesting. Would you like Mr. Sotiropoulos to comment? Thank you. Uh, I thank uh, Yanis Papayoriou and Pavlos Tsimas for these comments and questions. Let me say that um, uh, Professor Dimitris Katsikas has sent a message that he had to leave. This is because in the Greek public university, we have already started teaching. That has happened, however, at the postgraduate level. Mr. Katsikas teaches now a master's degree course and he had to leave. And um, that's why is not um, going to participate in the re remaining time uh, in this discussion. These were wonderful questions that you put. Um, criminal behavior is not populist, it's criminal. However, what uh, research which we put forward for you, I think has shown is that it is important to find out what is the rhetoric behind the criminal activity, whether criminal activity is couched in certain terms. Is it couched in terms of um, uh, interwar fascism in Italy or Germany, or is it couched, couched in modern terms, like terms, for instance, that have to do with the core of populist discourse in each country? So the same physical, uh, physical violence, which may have been exercised against vulnerable groups in one country could be couched, for instance, in anti-migrant terms. And in another country, the same physical violence um, exerted against the vulner vulnerable group would be couched in different populist terms. For example, uh, terms which are um, illustrating the age old physical prowess and, and um, uh, sexual chauvinism of um, what the populist believes defines himself, it's usually a man. So um, my uh, first answer is indeed um, various types of criminal violence cannot be understood as populist, but what matters is the way the perpetrator himself understands what he is doing and the way um, he tries to justify his, his action. Is it populist or not? then looking at the way this person talks and acts, we can say whether he, he is a populist or not. The uh, second comment I would like to make is that indeed, as uh, Yanis Papagiorio and Pavlis, Pavlos Chimas noted, many parties may seek to become popular by using some of the populist techniques or strategies, actually. One such strategy is to increase polarization. This is very evident. Um, in the pre-electoral period. Particularly, we understand that in electoral systems, which facilitate the um, sharp contest, if not conflict, between two competitors for political power, the intensity of political debate increases as we approach the date of elections. And it is in that short period before elections that I would uh, indeed agree with you that all major political actors, for example, two competitors for political power become populist in the sense that they understand the political world in terms uh, of the following way. It is either you vote for them or you vote for us. I think many important non-populist leaders, for example, leaders of 
centrist parties or conservative parties um, which have competed for power in Europe in various democracies exactly before the day of elections made the contrast between, between them and their competitors very sharp, almost in populist terms. However, I would like to backtrack now from this statement. I would like to say that uh, if a political leader or a party adopts such a dichotomic view of society and politics for a long time period, and also if a political party uh, promises everything to everyone in a demagogic fashion, we are, while at the same time this same political party um, points to the same targets, national elites, international elites, migrants, people um, of various identities, and this is done on a more or less protracted fashion, then the combination of these elements, the dichotomic view of the world, um, the demagogic style of uh, engaging in politics and uh, creating uh, fictional and real enemies, if you combine all these, then you do have a populist party. Um, and that is something I would like to, to uh, argue, not today, we don't have much time, perhaps on another occasion, because you can even trace populist policies, as my colleague Dimitris Katsikas has argued, after a populist party comes to power. The populist party in power, and I will not be long on this, continues this tactic of uh, making every um, bill of law as um, an opportunity, turning every bill of law as an opportunity to wage a global-like struggle against the forces of evil. Even after rising to government, populists pursue the same strategy, challenge the same targets, and so on and so forth. Um, finally, it is, it is true that um, if you, um, for example, meet someone who uses hate speech, on a bus, that is not really um, enough of evidence to call him or her a populist, but it is a sign, and that was the gist of the argument I tried to make, that for some time before you met this person, it has been normal in society to think of social relations in populist terms, in terms of hate, aggression, um, and also vulnerability, vulnerability of, of certain groups which um, we think, no, we think of, of being alien, um, not Greek enough, not normal enough. So my argument about populist rhetoric is that it becomes um, a vehicle on which after a certain threshold, not only populist actors, but non-populist actors ride and make populist ideology sound normal. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Sassanis, would you like to Comment on yes. Uh, so I, I'll just uh, uh, I agree with uh, uh, many of the answers uh, that Professor Sotiropoulos gave, um, but uh, I, I also have to acknowledge that uh, the, the questions raised by uh, uh, both Professor Papayergi and uh, Mr. Tsimas are quite valid. And uh, they're actually uh, quite prevalent uh, in the literature also. I mean, uh, one of the main problems of studying populism, especially in the past, was uh, that uh, many researchers uh, understood populism in different ways based on their regional or national experience. So they, tend to, they tended to define populism according to the movement, party, or political actor that uh, they examined in uh, uh, their particular place of origin and in, in, this, in a particular time. So for example, uh, in Latin America in the 80s, uh, populism meant, uh, wasn't conceived as an ideology, it was conceived uh, as something that uh, related to organizational characteristics of a movement, focusing on charismatic leadership. So if there was a charismatic leader, that uh, wanted to do away with intermediary institutions, uh, a, a group of scholars called this populism. Uh, another group of scholars uh, coming from uh, the economics discipline, looking again at Latin American populism, 
uh, define populism as uh, 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 max maximalism in terms of overpromising, in terms of irresponsible economic policy. So they look at, so we have an ontological problem here, right? Uh, different people looked at what can be loosely called different um, populist actors and movements and gave different uh, definitions and understandings uh, of populism. Uh, we reached a point that several scholars uh, said that populism, if it means everything, uh, then means nothing and we should unbutton the concept altogether. A compromise uh, that uh, was reached, and I think that right now is the most influential, it's not the only, but it's the most influential understanding of populism, is this minimal definition uh, of uh, that uh, we look at the bare bones concept of populism, which is a set of ideas, like we said, uh, that uh, of perceiving society uh, divided into two major camps, of a bad corrupt elite and uh, uh, a single uh, unified homogeneous uh, people that is also virtuous. So this is how, uh, I mean, Cas Moody is, is very famous for providing this definition and the benefits saying that, you know, uh, this definition travels well and it, and it captures different manifestations of populism in different times and places. So the second question that you ask is how useful is this? Uh, I mean, can we explain a uh, phenomenon by using uh, old terminology? I mean, does it uh, add something uh, to our understanding? Um, the argument that has been made is that if we perceive uh, populism as a thin ideology that can attach itself to more established ideologies, then we can create useful typologies of populist actors, including populist parties that we didn't have before. So in that sense, we have a new organizing tool of understanding uh, different uh, parties and movements. Uh, this, I mean, this argument is not without criticism, but uh, I mean, we can argue uh, about that, but this is the perspective. I think this is the defense of using populism uh, uh, in the last few years uh, in social and political science. Um, so um, this is the minimal definition. Again, is uh, our criminal acts, uh, is hate speech, uh, is racism a part of populism? Not necessarily. Uh, uh, like Professor Sotiropoulos says, it has to be a part of a larger package. Uh, it has to, I mean, this racism has to stem from the way that uh, the, the, the society is understood. Uh, the way that the people are constructed, if we perceive a, uh, that a dichotomy between the elite of the people exists uh, and, uh, uh, and we adopt a more exclusionary view of populism in the sense that our understanding of the people does not include migrants, uh, asylum seekers, or other minority groups, then one can make the argument that this type of, this variety of populism can lead someone to certain types of actions, verbal actions or physical actions. Now, how do we know that someone does this or says this because of populism? I mean, we cannot really uh, say that, but isn't that the problem with all ideologies? How can we really know that someone is a socialist? I mean, uh, we, we cannot psychoanalyze them. They say they believe in equality and uh, uh, you know, we have this same problem, I think, with all uh, ideologies. Okay, so uh, I, 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 about the, the final remark, um, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, and there has been also research uh, about populist rhetoric in terms of uh, in other uh, social platforms, social media platforms. Twitter has also been uh, a very, very productive uh, platform to study populism and other projects have been focusing on Twitter. Twitter has uh, some technical advantages in the sense that we can, uh, uh, we have access to more posts that we can download as researchers. Twitter provides some free access, uh, whereas uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Facebook, we have to be more selective. We cannot just download the, the Facebook sphere, whereas in the Twitter sphere, we can download and analyze parts of it. Uh, but it, it also has the limitations that you, uh, correctly pointed out that when it comes to content analysis and uh, text analysis, um, Twitter might be more interesting because it's more pithy, it's uh, sometimes more polarizing, and, and it's more aggressive uh, because it, 
it's it's designed to attract attention, as I suppose, with uh, uh, snippets of uh, text. But it's also different to reconstruct frames of interpretation uh, that we need in order to understand and reconstruct the worldviews of uh, uh, the clinical actors. So, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Now, um, Professor Obayeri, you would like to add some final remarks? Um, no, perhaps a little bit, yes. Um, I, I agree with Professor Sotiropoulos. Uh, Bob, how to put it? Uh, it? It's the chicken and egg a little bit situation. Populist behavior allows for an easy rise of populist parties. And populist parties instigate populist behavior. Uh, yeah. It has, in, in some cases, they feed each other. In other cases, populism draws on a wider, let's say, tradition of violence or of, um, of, of, of hostility within a society, I think. I mean, it's very interesting that uh, populism did not particularly succeed. I mean, it didn't fail, but we saw the German elections that populist, uh, the, the AfD, lost, I mean, lost power, I mean, lost a little bit. They didn't, it didn't lose in Eastern Germany, but it did not manage to draw on uh, the impact of, um, of the lockdown, of the COVID, of, of all the, it, it was a, a good breeding uh, ground for populism and it did not succeed. Why? Perhaps because the German society is less populist prone. I don't know. It, some societies may be more conflictual. And conflictual societies are easier prey to populist policies and also more violent to each other and especially to target groups of populist policies. Uh, if, you feel, uh, if you feel that... Um, your place, your, your job is threatened by migrants. Migrants becomes uh, become uh, a, an easy target. If you feel that, uh, I remember, um, and that's what I finish. Uh, you have to to show it to to students. Um, he, there was one um, extremely interesting pub publicity, political publicity of the Swedish Democrats. When it first became an important party, I think it was the elections in 2014 or something, and there was no voice, uh, nothing. It was the image of an elderly Swedish lady who was walking with a cane, or she was not moving well, towards a building which had signs like social security or social welfare. And she was pushed aside by a, a Muslim lady or a lady with a hijab, more correctly, dragging along two or three children and with um, a, a Landau pushing another baby who were pushing in front of her to go in front of, uh, ahead of her to, to go into that public welfare um, facilities. Mm -hmm. It was an extremely powerful message to elderly persons who are afraid to families who think that migrants are going to take away they are people uh, I'm paying money and some other one someone else receives that money so it was a very the, the, it was a powerful message drawing on fear and I think societies that are more optimistic or more, sure of themselves are less prone to uh, to populism so perhaps we should try to make more happy society i mean or not happy let's say more solid societies in order to uh, to, to deal with populism that's for me and i i don't want to take more time more of your time okay thank you yeah, yeah you made two very interesting remarks a that populism uh, is has a better chance in conflictual societies. So we have to look at that. And then that uh, a society that is optimistic, that is, and uh, in other words, I would say 
when the, the especially the middle classes of a society are upwards uh, moving or, or hoping to move upwards, there is no much room for, 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 for populists to, 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 uh, to gain ground. But uh, when uh, societies are becoming pessimistic, when people have, are fearing, the future is a factor of fear for ordinary people, then populism has a chance. I mean, these are very interesting and uh, uh, remarks. I think we have run out of time, so I have to thank everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, your remarks, uh, Professor Bobayorgiu. Professor Sotiropoulos, Mr. Tatsanis, thank you very much. And uh, uh, the rest you. of you that have been participating. This would be available in, I guess, in some time from now online. And so uh, those who haven't been able to attend today, but uh, would like to follow that, will have the chance to do it in the coming days. OK. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks a lot. Have a nice afternoon.